ใจไม่ค่อยพิเศษมากพอเสียสติดีสติ Not so great, but <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, we are getting into it. So uh, be uh, acquainting yourself with the night. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's um, he's tiny, so he's like two point five kg. So we have to feed him um, like every three hours. Ah. Oh. Because uh, yeah, he came early, so he's two point five. So he, even he's, if he's sleeping, the doctor told us just wake him and feed him. <laughs> so it's oh yeah, but it, it's he's yeah he gained some weight since uh, last four days. So we're like okay, good. <laughs> hey, hi Steve. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll post a yeah. Let me post a picture. Yeah, <laughs> but he's basically just eating, sleeping, pooping. <laughs> yeah, it's probably gonna yeah, be like the next two years. Much more complicated later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Time to enjoy life. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. We just. Gave him a bottle and uh, now he's sleeping. So I said, "Okay, sleep through my Kaggle session." <laughs> <laughs> How long would he sleep for? Um, so another, maybe another hour and a half or two hours. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Are you suffering from uh, sleep deprivation yet? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last last night was bad. You no, know, the night before, uh, so I fed him at one, and then at four he was crying, and I didn't even hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and he he just next to us, next sleeping next to us in the room, and my wife. Then my wife got up and fed him at four, but I just slept through that one. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> that's dead. <laughs> but I think I was just really tired, so just. Uh, It's okay. Yeah, I was just telling uh, Srinivas he's uh, he's two point five kg. So it's, yesterday we had a doctor's appointment, and you know they do the weight and they give you the percentile, like where your baby is. Yeah. <laughs> so he's at one percentile. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the US why they why two point five in India two point five is like yeah like some is okay but yeah. <laughs> So he's less than six pounds, um, right? Like he, he's under one percent. And I'm like, what is under? <laughs> How can that be? <laughs> Does he look yeah. very small then? Ah, uh, wait. No, he's so he's he's tall. So yeah. he's nineteen point two five inches. But he he's just skinny. Yeah. So um so he um. He came in. He came at after thirty six weeks, right? So they say like, if he had stayed two more weeks, um, like thirty seven and thirty eight would be where he would put on fat. Yeah, yeah. So he's all bones. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll post a picture with you on, on just for the three of us. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. But he's very yep. alert and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. That's it. That's okay. 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 <clears throat> yeah. So, um, I was looking at some um, stuff on, you know, what people were posting, and experience that we are having is very similar to what everybody is posting. That they're having terrible time getting any. Learning and everybody is between point five and point six, even when they are using um, all kinds of uh, tricks. And then I saw I can um, point to the um, thing later on. Maybe Steve can tell us what else he was able to try. But then um, I looked at a couple of things which I kind of posted about too that. 
you know, one is the paper that Steve himself had uh, pointed to way back. And apparently they, uh, you know, among the things that people were pointing out that they claim to have done, which is somewhat different in, um, than what uh, anybody here, meaning in the competition, has been able to achieve is getting the input numbers up to 300K. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of put a snippet right in the chat about how they were uh, getting that number. But that, you know, I thought about it some more after I posted it and overnight. Uh, it's not only babies that keep people awake, it's stupid things like this too, I think, for me. But um, <clears throat> like middle of the night, I was like, wait, um, how do they flip and rotate images since we, in the process of kind of making them all similar, eliminate any of those things? Um, so any thoughts? about that as to how they get the, you know, through augmentation, get it to 300K? Um, oh, sorry. I don't know. Uh, how many did you say? Yeah, so like I've sort of pretty much just copied their solution or whatever, or trying to recreate theirs. Um, yeah, so yeah, like I've got it down now, like I take the MRI slices and find this, the tumors and then slice it up into 32 by 32 cubes. Um, so, so like I think you know, like in the chat you'd posted or in this whatever, you'd, you'd posted that we were, can't remember how many you said that, can't remember how many cubes I have. Um, but yeah, like I've got some augmentation, but I haven't run with it yet. Um, um, okay. So those 32 by 32, um, see, my question of confusion is, um, so you get it down to that only the uh, uh, tumor stuff, and then you flip and rotate and treat each of those as different images? Is that what is going on? If you were to implement augmentation after all the um, slicing and segmentation and everything so that you are now only focused on the tumor and then you can kind of left flip, right flip um, um, and do all those things. Yeah, so can you see my screen here? Yeah. Yeah, so like I've got this class, which it, um yeah so like this just loads the region where the tumor is um yeah like it it loads like just like a 32 bit aligned bit of the mri scan that corresponds to the tumor um and then it chops it up into 32 bit cubes um but what it does is rather than just chopping it into sort of cubes that are beside each other it has like offset cubes so like if you've got if your tumor was what 64 bits wide it wouldn't just give you two cubes back it would give you it goes like it offsets of like eight pixels so it would give you whatever that is uh, like sort of five per square so that it would give you sort of 10 in each dimension and then because it's three dimensional you multiply those so you end up like with yeah like quite a lot of cubes um and then yeah so here i, I got this augmentation code um which which is doing like three-dimensional augmentation so it, it's training on like each of these cubes and they can come in so yeah like you can like flip them and sort of offset what's inside them a bit and scale them and things. So it's working on like each of the cubes. So yeah, so like here, this is just us one slice through the cube. Um, so yeah, like each of these is 32 by 32. Um, and then this is like with augmentations, but it doesn't, these don't match up because of the fact that the, the data set shuffled. But I had like noise on it 
want to put this noise on though like some of the pictures that just went to it looked to me like to be completely random noise um so yeah like so like that massively increased the 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 training set i could potentially have because of the fact that yeah each, each cube can be rotated and flipped and whatever um but i didn't get very good results from it but i only ran it for one um but like those, these are the 3D augmentations. Then there was like, there was like you know your standard transforms. Um, but like all of these, these would have just been like sort of two dimensional transforms as opposed to the augmentations are running in in 3D. Um, but yeah, so um, somewhere at, in amongst all of this lot, there was. Um, Yeah, these are, I don't know what all these are. Um, uh, I think, um, yeah, somewhere, this one here, this is the one. Um, yeah, so. It's less than the 5963, which is your best. Um, yeah, so like it, it did train with the stuff, but um, yeah, like the validation loss you can see is like pretty high. It, it's not really sort of coming down, but I haven't really had that much of a chance to play with with this one. So um, yeah. Uh, so you, you will, I mean, but at least you, so the way it works, the augmentation is to convert it into the 3D cubes, then apply augmentation in 3D. So That's by right. the time you apply it, then you don't care about, because you have segmented it to only the tumor pixels, you don't really care about the orientation and what I was concerned about is, you know, we are trying to, during the process of generating the cubes, eliminate, um, you know, directional stuff. So again, if we flip, I was like, how would that help? But it helps because we have segmented it to be only the human pixels. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so like I, I tried quite a few things like, these ones down the bottom, these were like two-dimensional 2D stuff. So like this was, um, yes, so like this, like taking the MRI scans, yeah, like after I've pre-processed them all and put them all into the same orientation and converted them all into NumPy arrays. And then, yeah, so this was only taking the slices that had tumors on it, but it was the, the complete slice. So like that's that's for each of these. Um, so that the, the type, yeah, like the score I was looking for was like on on the rock score, like to see what the best of those I, I could find would be. Um, also, yeah, so I, are you choosing the, the model based on the loss or the score? Uh, uh, at the model, the model at the minute I'm saving on the on the rock score, but. Yeah, like at the minute, I'm not actually using any of the models because I was like waiting to see if I could get a better one. So you can see like all of the rock score. Yes, like this is the competition metric, isn't it? So right. it's all just coming in sort of 0. 0.5. And um, yeah, so like the, the T1, one, yeah, I can't remember. But yeah, like I think. T1 was giving me the best scores, but like then since that, yeah, so like now I've moved on to um, onto the three dimensional ones, which is using the cube thing I was talking about and like the overlapping cubes. Because like when I had like just cubes by itself, you didn't get very many cubes in a tumor. And so like I've moved to the overlapping ones. Um, and then, yeah, like I had, Yeah, I think it's down here. 
it's fucked. Oh yeah, so I finally like made it through the the point six barrier there. Um, but what I've done in here, if I can find, yeah. So like here's the the model. So like this is basically just the same as the two D one I had. It's like sort of like a ResNet where it's got like these blocks, like ResNet type blocks. Um, initially like it had four. And so that score I got there of like the 0.62, gradually I've been chopping the blocks out. So I was like down, so it's only got two of these blocks now. So that's, each block is like two CNN layers, two ConvNet layers on it. So. Yeah, this so is basically this like is, a two layer ResNet or whatever. Two, two conventional blocks connected with residual connection. Yeah, so like that's, as I say, it's, yeah, got two. Each block is like two convnet layers. I I tried like a load of different models and stuff. And, um, yeah. So it, it seems to be every time I chop a, a block out, I get a slightly better score. So I haven't tried it down to just one block yet, but two blocks was the best I've I've got so far. Um, but yeah. So as I say, like that's that score was like. Whatever it is, um, the, the, uh, yeah, and the best rock. This is this one. But, um, but with three D, you haven't tried each of the individual um, types to determine which one gives you the best. You just chose T one W based on the two D results. Is that right? That that's right. Yeah. Um. So. So in 3D, at least when I didn't do, I mean, the segmentation and all that, my consistent observation was the mm. flare and um, one WC, I think, rather than just T1 W, were the ones which were giving me good results and the other two were like relatively bad. Mm. But, you know, that again is like based on not segmenting and just using entire um, image, but at if I recall correctly, sixty four by sixty four cubes, and again not overlapping cubes because obviously whole thing. <clears throat> the other, uh, uh, you know, there were two three things about. Uh, details that somebody had uh, extracted, they had posted, which caught my attention. The one was this augmentation thing. The second, which was uh, also confusing, and I was wondering why they would do it, and also how that would help or uh, in any way, which is they also mentioned that while they train on just the Tumor pixels. The validation is done on the uh, pixels, including the non-tumor pixels. Does that sense to you? They're doing also. Um, so they mentioned that the extract mentioned that while they train on the segmented tumor-only pixel images, the validation images they use are not just of the tumor. It's the entire thing, including masked non-tumor pixels. Um, yeah, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make much sense to me because of the fact that, well, yeah, like certainly like in my case, so the model has only been trained on the areas of the MRI, which my segmentation model says have tumors in them. So you'd think that yeah, like, why would you want to give it bits of the brain that it hasn't been trained on? Yeah, and maybe even it's, whether it would... Sorry, go ahead. Um, I, I was going to say, like, maybe they've done that because of the fact that, obviously, if you do that, then you don't need to run your segmentation model on your test data. Perhaps they were having trouble running that. Yeah, that's a good point. That's, that's a good point. I didn't think of that angle that it would speed up 
your um, test and validation processing, right? Because you're not going through, well, you would still need to go through to train it though. I mean, it's only in inference that you don't do that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, but like you were yeah, saying. Yeah, I thought that was a strange thing that, um, you know, I was trying to wrap my head around a why you would do that and your point about you know inference speed up is a good one i hadn't thought of that so that's an excellent point but the flip thing i was wondering is you know wouldn't your thing wouldn't your model perform worse because it's you said it's trained only on something and then it's seeing a lot of negative or now that i think about it is that there's a negative help to say these are things where there is no tumor but that but we're not kind of basing on whether there is tumor or not. We are basing on whether or we are classifying whether something in the tumor is or isn't there, right? So that the fact that there is a lot of pixels not having any tumor should have like zero impact. I just thought it was weird that they did that. Yeah. Yeah, like my whole assumption is basically that from that paper that um, by looking at the tumor, you can sort of recognize something in the structure of the tumor that identifies if if it has MGMT or not. And so, yeah, like certainly from my, from the training I can do, like it, it, it's getting like 99% accuracy on the training set. So it looks as if it can sort of identify something in the images it's seeing. But yeah, it's just not generalizing well at all. But I wouldn't see it any advantage at all in sort of giving it bits of the brain that weren't the tumor if, if you've only trained on the tumor. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, what you said makes sense that it's probably just sheer speed up of inference, right? Because you don't have to process the test images to generate yeah. the tumor only you just kind of predict hello yeah so but i still can't wrap my head around that either because then how you know if without how do you even know where the tumor is if yeah. You are in... yeah plus as well because of the fact that yeah so like i and i slice the tumor as i say into like cubes but like the, all the cubes overlap which, which means I get like a lot of a lot of cubes in each tumor, and so yeah, like it takes like a reasonable amount of my time to sort of process them. So I, if I was having to do that across the whole of the the brain as opposed to just where the tumor is, I would have a massive amount of cubes to analyze at inference time. Um, yeah, like and I don't think that would help, but. Um, so can you yeah. see my? Green. Yeah. Yep. So, see, here is the extract that I was referring to. Is this from the, the paper that I had shared before? I believe yeah. so, because is yeah, that, like isn't that the saying, paper, the Yogananda paper or whatever, et al. 2021? I think so, yeah. Yeah, like certainly they say in their paper, but they have 75% overlapping 3D patches. Yeah, so that's that, right? Now, yep. if you see here, right, this is an extract from there. So, see, this is what 25. Yeah, but the other thing there, you see, like they're saying only patches with it one, at least one tumor voxel were included. What does that mean? Does that right. just mean one, one pixel in the whole? 32 by 32 by 32. Yeah, it, that's what I, I mean, a voxel is just like a pixel. So at yeah. least one voxel, then I was very confused about that too. Like you're thinking, uh, so are they saying that even if there is a single voxel, they include that slice in case as part of the slices that get counted for example in your you know in generation of the 3d stuff is that all it means it, it sounds like that whereas yeah like i'm not doing that um yeah like i have a, a bit of code in that checks to see how many tumor pixels are in the cube 
and I actually at the minute like I'm rejecting cubes that have less than ten percent of their cube as uh, tumor pixels. Um, the reason I was doing that was originally when I like went to sort of get the area that has the tumor, I was just multiplying the the MRI um, NumPy array by the segmentation array. So like the segmentation array is obviously binary. So like when I multiply the two together, it only left me with the tumor from the original, which meant that everything mm -hmm. around the outside of the tumor was set to zero. And so like I ended up with cubes, which were all zero. Um, and so, yeah, so I put a bit of code in that would discard any cube that had less than 10% tumor to get rid of all these blank ones. But yeah, since that I've changed it now so that it includes the bit of the brain around the tumor as well, um, which gives me better results. So perhaps I should, uh, perhaps I should sort of go with what they have and like, yeah, like just take uh, drop it even more to like very low number. Yes, yeah, sort of, or even like the single voxel, as they say. Yes, yeah, so stop discarding them. So as because of the fact now that, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I'm still throwing away quite a few, whereas yeah, perhaps I shouldn't do that. Mm. But you see, the second line for testing over the entire image was sampled, um, including oh. background mask voxels of value zero. That puzzled me. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, because why would you then include background masked voxels, zero voxels, when you're testing? Other than maybe, as you said, for speed reasons. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe but... it is just. And then um, this is the part that I was referring to. The only thing is. Um, and again, I was thinking, how would you augment by including downsampling? That means you would reduce the size of the cube that you're having from 32 by 32 down, or by you know like um, make it 16 by 16 by 16. What does it mean to reduce downsample the image by 50% and 25%? I don't know, like the next bit about reducing the voxel resolution. Perhaps they're, yeah, just like squeezing twice as much, keeping the cubes at the same size, but squeezing twice as much of the original image into it. Yeah, the downsampling is just, you know, like um, you take every other, every other voxel or then you could take every, so I think 50% will be every other and 25% will be every fourth. Right. But how does that, um, oh, it reduces the resolution. It means you're not as fine. So that means that's why. You're... Yeah, okay. right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So you, like, let, yeah, you, like you had a photo camera that was like, 12 pixels, 12 megapixels, right? And you, you just, if you took every other pixel, it you could simulate a six megapixel camera. Some, some, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because what I, remember we were discussing this, I think, last week, Steve, that our, you know, we suffer from a lack of samples, so, um, you know, if we have only five, if we have 500, then, um, and we are only using 80% of that, that's 400. So, uh, you know, 400 um, doesn't give us, uh, we did the math, I think we ended up at around, if I recall correctly, 15K or something. And 15K compared to 300K is like an order of magnitude and then two acts. 
by it. So I thought that that is probably a big factor because we are so starved for samples that that's probably what causes the overfitting problems. And if we increase the input to be, you know, an order of magnitude more than where we are and um, 2x, meaning like 20x, because instead of 15k, we get 300k, then that ought to really improve uh, the training and make the training, in a sense, harder but better and thereby help the model generalize. Yeah. That's at least my thinking that oh, that could be a big factor in the struggle to generalize. Yeah, as I say, I have like 3D augmentation, but I, I didn't really understand it so much because it was like, I, I didn't know exactly what it was doing. It was, but uh, yeah, I was going to like gradually sort of try and add it in. And so, yeah, hopefully that should sort of improve, increase the number of samples I have and increase the generalization. Yeah. You know, because this, and you already have the noise, so maybe it's just a question of, I don't know whether there is something which specific about this salt temperature noise. Uh, may all you know anything about that. I've seen Gaussian noise easily added, but I don't know whether this is something different. Uh, obviously, it is something different, but I don't know what the difference is between salt and pepper noise and Gaussian noise. Yeah, so so Gaussian noise will be from a Gaussian distribution, right? Um, and salt and pepper is just like... Um, like either some pixels are 255, zero. So salt is the white and pepper is the black. And they might have some mm. fre some frequency to assign that. Yeah. Gaussian noise, yeah, just from some yeah, some Gaussian distribution. Yeah, so Gaussian you, noise I've seen, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Pick from, but I didn't know. So this is randomly setting pixels to their main max values. So max like. or yeah, max or min. Yeah. And then um, you know, flipping, I think Steve, you're already doing that, but do you know what these two things are? And, uh, is translational rotation basically rotation by anything less than 90 degrees and more than 90 degrees? Actually, this thing. That, that term is weird, uh, random and translation. So normally, normally it's like two separate things. It's like a translation. So translation just means like move, moving in X, Y, or Z, right? And then rotation would be like, Okay, yeah, rotation in X, Y, or Z. So which which axis you rotate it around? Um, it's. I wonder if he just forgot to put a comma. Like I don't know what translational rotation is. Or like. Um, yeah. I think it's maybe the rotate what... and then the shift. Yeah, maybe rotate and yeah, could be yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, projective. I've heard this. This one I don't know. Uh, but Mo Mona might have it. If it's like, uh, let, let me check while while you uh, while we are talking. Uh, mm. So I think I mean the basic reason why I zoned in on this was this. All these things seem to and the resolution thing. All of them seem to yield them the goal of getting to this higher number, which yeah. given our you know struggles are with lack of generalization. It just seemed to me that that's something we should focus on because I think that's what is blocking so many people on this problem, uh, on this particular challenge. Mm. Right. So that's something that I was... The second thing I didn't understand, Steve, is what is... Mm this mean why are they producing two volumes which are then combined I, I didn't get this part um i'm not sure if you look at where their original paper is the, the site for their original paper has like a supplement bit which shows like a more yeah. detailed um, diagram diagram of their model right. um, and like within it they have sort of two channels coming in um, so 
I'm not sure is it something to do with that. Plus, as well, they seem to have like um, what was I going to say? Oh, I can't remember now, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. Sorry, so. But yeah, yeah like, so certainly no, the model I, had like I kind of, and the pathways. paper unfortunately was not very well explained, or you know, kind of left a lot. No, it's like very. I thought it's like very lacking in detail, isn't it? Um, yeah, 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 that's what exactly. I thought as well. Usually, the technical papers are much better written than this. Yeah, so I was as left. well. They don't. They give very little information about their um, their their code that they were using. So, yeah, yep. No, you know, repository or anything of that kind. Just said, well, we get great results. I talk. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. somebody in this same thread talked about you know this thing that I was referring to because. Uh, so this guy said he's running da, 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 and then he was at 0.7 or somewhere in that range. But, um, and then he says the one thing that shows signs of life is normalizing in the 3D voxel space using 3D this thing, Lehi or whatever. And there's apparently some big guy. Yeah. Um, did you find out what that was, or? Yeah, yeah, I did. And if I can show it, it's contrast limited adaptive histogram equalization. So they call it equalization, and again, my whole question is: Is equalization same as normalization, or are the two different, or are they applied similarly in this case? Or I wasn't sure. Yeah, it's just uh, another. Uh, like no image normalization technique. Um, I was trying to find code for it, like PyTorch code. Yeah, so I posted the link, right? So there is this in the cornea stuff. Uh -huh. It says there is a Clahi implementation in Torch. So I posted that link. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I know. So like, there is a cornea a thing. So I was wondering, Steve. Now I'm still confused. Where you do this? Did you do? Do you do we do it after you get because he says three D. Um, so here, um, you know, he says normalizing in the 3D voxel space using 3D Clahi. Um, so would this be after um, segmenting and getting the 3D tumor pixels, you normalize using this, or do you normalize before you segment? And perhaps, yeah, like when I, at the minute, so, yeah, so I've taken like the the DICOM images and converted them all to to NumPy, and I think it like it normalizes at that stage by yeah like just sort of dividing by the max and stuff, and then when I load them in to put them yeah to to bring them in the NumPy arrays, bring them in. I think it normalizes again. But they're they're just normalizing sort of against themselves. Yeah, you know, like just like sort of taking the max and dividing by the max or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, your standard right. type of normalization. So I don't normalize against each other. And I was wondering that because you know, like if you're like running like say like a ResNet model, you would like apply those values, the normalization that takes the standard deviation and the mean and applies it to all of right. the images. So yeah, so perhaps there would be worth that applying it across the data set. Yeah, so this is something else that I that caught my eye because this whole thread was devoted to man, I'm not getting any better and it's not generalizing at all. So what the hell is wrong? And you know, people discussing ideas yeah. and uh, 
so these were the only two meaning when i say these this clacky one is one and the other one was you know the paper excerpt which said getting the number up to 300k those were the only two that i found kind of practical and applicable everybody else was otherwise speculating yeah did any did you guys okay so so yeah um, actually i had a general question about uh, is anyone doing like you know you okay we we segment so the segmentation we do with deep learning but then uh, once you have the lesion mask um, you can extract various properties of the lesion so so the simplest is just like uh, say shape so mean diameter um like some uh, but there but are I mean, many uh, steve has like uh, yeah i mean steve has already calculated in fact i was i think last week also we talked about it but i don't know that um i haven't seen whether anybody is act- um i should look into that you had raised the point whether anybody is implementing that but steve for example has calculated the total number of pixels in the tumor for example hey which you know roughly speaking because he does it over 3d you could think of it as a proxy for the volume right i mean it's not an exact thing but it's the proxy for the volume right the number of pixels in the tumor yeah um, so- for example and those were the things that you were after right like i mean so the slice with the broadest thing he has that and i'm sure he can then calculate how many pixels um is it for width or how much is the largest height or things like that that's kind of what you are asking correct uh yeah if you can you open this link called uh, pi radiomics py and then uh, radiomics if you just yeah get yeah the github will do yeah yeah, yeah this one so and if you just scroll down a little bit ah see this yeah yeah here we go so uh, you can have uh, things so the first first order statistics like those are like just uh, mean standard deviation mean uh, kurtosis skewness like that but then you have all these gray level a co-occurrence matrix and gray level so all of these features so what what they are trying to capture the the intuition is that they are trying to capture the texture of the of the of the region of interest so uh, but yeah we, i don't know enough biology like if if the texture changes for the two types but uh, like these um, i think i i saw one of one paper even with brain tumors that was using like uh, these features and then these are i, I don't know what these wavelet based ones are um yeah but uh, stick with that for a minute so i was thinking about this too so let's say we apply these and um you know extract and steve had another excellent idea last week which is he was also saying you can get meta data from just the mri things right like for example yeah. he was mentioning mm-hmm. the sex right. of the patient because yeah. if women have high probability of having mgmt that's an important factor too right mm-hmm. yeah yeah um so we could use those now assuming let's say for a minute that we get these first level stats by using this package and stuff for a minute let's set that aside and then we'll dive into it but assuming that we do then would you just input that and combine it with the you know when are the, the with the steve's kind of resnet you kind of get the output of the second level which is kind of the feature extracted version uh, of your image um would you then just flatten it and combine these let's say we generate five six such yeah uh, um vec- vectors and maybe take them through a you know like a matrix or whatever to put them into high dimensions consistent meaning everything throw it into like a uh, 100 dimension 150 dimension vector and then just 
take them through a couple of flat layers and combine it that way to get the prediction on classification yeah no exactly like so i i've seen two or three approaches so the first one like you said um you you make like let's say we combine the image features and like say dicom features and and finally we have a 100 dimensional vector and we pass that through a couple of um fully connected layers and yeah just just go the neural network way or take take that 100 dimensional feature vector and just go to xgboost and okay no no more neural network from once you have you you are just using the the deep learning for segmentation and uh, say doing yeah well, like feature and extraction. yeah feature extraction and then you go to xgboost and because if if your features are good enough like any any classifier should work um but i i it it would be i think we we can i saw one paper where they were trying how to combine um like like what you were saying from last week you and steve like uh, um let's say you have the image features and then you have things like the the gender right um and there's a lot of um lot of things in the dicom headers or other variables um I'll, i'll see if i can find it again it, um the yeah, like like do you just flatten the image features and yeah, how, how do you do that so that that could be um, yeah yeah those were the two main ideas yeah but see this became quite big that it is you know it's like uh, can you go how many stars on this one um, like on this repo i just gonna... okay it's decent yeah and it's not uh... yeah that whole area is just called radiomics so it's like uh, because ev- everybody is doing this um um yeah like okay can 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 something in the mri that we cannot see uh, maybe some texture pattern or some you know there's some variation of intensities can that yeah, you know is there more information than we can see and this takes two inputs it takes the mask and the image as input yeah. what well, so you can just give it like an mri scan and they what the segmentation yeah and the segmentation i think you um if there is i think you can even just we can just give it like we can give it like two numpy arrays one for the segmentation and one for the mri yeah. and it will it will just output the features yeah Uh, let me see if i can find the i remember before before uh, uh, rohan was born we were uh, i was looking at like the example how to run it um, um, oh yeah and this uh, uh, this is interesting so you see he says segment based and voxel based so so segment based always made sense to me so it's like okay i give you i give you the the uh, lesion segmentation mask and you tell me tell me something interesting about that area right is there like so like the simplest texture you can think of is like criss cross patterns or you know is is it like they they will use terms like wavy texture or um yeah it's like um, you, you, it comes from like a long image processing field like you know image texture um, The, but the second one is i am always i haven't been a big fan so they, they call it voxel based so they are like at each voxel um is there uh, see i can't even describe it. <laughs> uh, but but everything has to be registered in the same space and then you say okay is uh, does this voxel differentiate between the two classes right uh, each tiny voxel but um, Uh, so when does it end by the way when do you have to submit yeah, we, the final yeah we don't have too much time like 15th or something right yeah uh-huh. i'm not sure can you take a look and... yeah, yeah i'm just i'm just looking uh timeline october team october 15th yeah what what's the time on that is it 
uh, 11.59 UTC. What is it UTC? Your time, is it? No, uh, my no, hour. Your time. Your time, I think, yeah. Your time, so, midnight, I think. Yeah, oh, midnight. 11 or no, midnight. Yeah, for us, it is it is 5. So it's 5 p.m. on 5 p.m. or 4 p.m. on October 15th. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and it's also, I get confused. You, you guys are now, I don't know whether you're a TTC or one behind or one ahead. Well, um, yeah, I think we're an hour ahead of GMT at the minute. But yeah, obviously the clocks go, well, October the 21st or something. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. So it's after. So you still one hour. You'd still be. You would be one hour ahead, which means you get. I guess. Um, it'll be your time at one. If I'm. Yeah, because right. it, it normally happens that I don't know, like uh, USA goes a day ahead of us or something. Because yeah, like I've tended to miss a few Kaggle meetings in the past because of the fact that, like America's oops, America's clocks have changed. And mine haven't. But. Oh, really? No, uh, we, nowadays we switch later in uh, fall and I think earlier in spring. Because we want to reduce the number of, the amount of days we spend with the clocks shifted yeah. uh, back or forward. So we pushed it out in October and pulled it in, in, we pushed it out in fall and pulled it in in spring. So that shrinks the time when we are not in daylight hours. Yeah, like... That's the way uh, I remember it. Yeah, I think you go at the sort of the same time as, as here, but it seems to be like America goes a day earlier. But... Yeah, yeah, last uh, year I thought it was almost like a week or something. Yeah, but you anyway, know. it looks like yeah the competition ends after our clocks will be going. So yeah, it shouldn't affect us. Yeah, so yeah same thing for us. So that's midnight on this Friday then for me. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, there's not very long yeah. left. So. Yeah, yeah. I know it's that's the other thing I was thinking too is. There's not much time left to do much anyway. Yeah. So you could have to, you might have to pick the two or you know one yeah. or two things you may even be able to try. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so like uh, in the short time I had left, I was thinking of just yeah, like as I say, I, I've got like the augmentation stuff which I hadn't really tried putting in yet, and um, yeah, like I can get a sort of about a 0.6 on the on the rock score by cutting the layers down so i was going to just like try like going to k folds on that and like try augmentation with k folds and see if i can get j just by sort of averaging the models will it help me yeah that's another like instead of single split just do like three fold or something right yeah um, yeah, the augmentation plus augmentation. Yeah, the augmentations I have though, again, they've you know like that book I was always on about the deep learning with PyTorch. Basically, they've come out of it, um, but they are all sort of like handcrafted augmentations to like flip and rotate and stuff. Do you know does Monai Monai does it have three uh, D augmentations? Because if if there was like sort of a library of 3D augmentations that had been better tested, it would be better than, yeah, I wasn't convinced by the ones I had, which is why I hadn't really tried them yet. Yeah, it should, this should have transformed. Uh, if you... Uh, I, know, I know it has 2D transforms, but I wasn't sure if it had 3D ones. Oh, uh, 3D. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, like I want to be able to sort of take these cubes and sort of flip them upside down or rotate mm -hmm. them and whatever and change their intensity and stuff. I could do it like using 2D ones, but then I would have to sort of... No, no, they should be 3D somewhere. Um, if this doesn't have it, uh, um, can you, 
yeah if you after you finish scrolling the other one is to check uh, torch io i think that that was the whole you know like selling point of the torch torch io that um yeah let me let me check okay Oh yeah. Ah, uh, okay. This one. Let me share a link. This looks pretty good. Uh, you can share the. I stop sharing. So if you want to. Share. Oh okay. You you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, because he made the whole purpose of this entire uh, toolkit was just data augmentation and pre-processing. Um, so, ah, nice. You see, like this is the blurring. Ah, uh, this might be salt. Ah, no, this is not salt and pepper. Yeah. So this is when you do rotation and translations. This one ran. So it says random affine. Uh, okay, okay. This this random. Okay, it's on the top. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm just uh, okay. Random blur. Okay, origin. So original on this side. Random affine. Elastic is the one where you, you know, like do uh, local transformation deformations. Uh, yeah. Um, this happens. This is a very MRI specific one. It it happens sometimes in the scanner. Like you you. You expect like pretty homogeneous, but you see it becomes black sometimes. Uh, so that's just like a MRI machine issue. Uh, this the, these these three are very MRI specific. Uh, one, two, three, uh, and they should have. Let me see. What is this? I'm. I meant to ask you. Do you know? You know, like the uh, procedure or the program they put the original data through, and like it talks about uh, when they are sort of creating the the task one data set. Yeah. They were applying some normalization thing to to counteract um, MRI scan stuff, and it, I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, yeah. But Bi bias field correction. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, so I'm not doing that when I convert my DICOM images to NumPy. Yeah. Should, is that something that should be applied? Because I remember in like in the original bit where it like it listed the steps they go through to change theirs that it said, yeah, we do that bias field correction thing, but it's yeah. not used in the final thing. So, yeah, because I've noticed, you, you know, like in, in the task two data that we were given, um, uh -huh. yeah, so like I'm just like applying sort of bits of code that I found here and there to like change the orientation to put everything in, into Axial. Yeah. But yeah, some of the images don't look the same as some others. And like, I, I was wondering, was it because of like things like that? No, that one, uh, yeah, they, he, this, like, this library uses that as even as a, as a, a data augmentation method. So he uses, he just calls it like random bias field and we see, um, yeah, see it will, you, you see here where, so that one is, I, I don't know if you've seen a case like this where part of the brain is like bright and part of it is dark. Mm. So here is, here it's very clear. You see the back of the brain is bright and yeah. the, so this, if it's dark throughout, it's fine. Or if bright throughout, it's fine. But if you have this kind of inconsistency, then uh, that that's what the correction is for. Um, but but we can use it as a data augmentation, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, do, do you know what are these tumors 3d sorry are these augmentations 3d or is that all just 2d okay give me a second uh Hey, why is it so hard to find? <laughs> yeah. uh, I want to. I want to say 3D, but I want to find the documentation. Which yeah, see, this is the random crap thing, right? Like you can do, you can move uh, uh, a random swap blocks in the brain. And so I, this makes me think it is 3D because he, he's showing it in all three orientations. So it's it just like three lines of code. So he just took like, uh, yeah. <laughs> but let me, I think this library might be easily, blah, blah, blah. Am I okay? Let me, let me share the whole screen. Yeah, efficient for the augmentation of 3D medical images, blah, blah, blah. Uh, started. Transforms. Introduction. Um, oh, yeah, like there it says. Um, 4D Pi yeah. Torch Tensors. And 40 numpy arrays. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh, yeah, so. uh -huh, yeah. Yeah, cool, because as I say, I wasn't very happy with the ones I had. They didn't look as if they were working quite okay. right. They were just handcrafted, so this uh -huh. would be a lot better. Yeah, and oh, I remember, okay, I remember, sorry, it's slowly coming back. <laughs> I remember this, this composability was a big thing because, um, you know, like how you said, you, you rotate first and then you translate. Like, yeah. Or or you do it like in so so here he has like let let's say you wanted a pipeline like this. Uh, so he has this uh, TIO is torch IO and then compose, and you can say okay, take one of the spatial transforms with a probability of 0.5. Okay, and uh, so you do either you do this elastic or you do this random affine, and then you do. The intensity rescale, but in in your case maybe the intensity rescale is done, so you, you can skip that. But we we could do something else. Uh, I and, and you see how the, so the spatial transforms are defined as what is this uh, dictionary, right? Yeah, dictionary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. So you do a random random elastic like 0.2 percent of the time and random affine 80 percent of the time, and uh, wait, that's weird. Oh, that no, sorry, that might be a maybe that's a parameter. Okay, but, but oh, that yeah, and you can also the dictionary there mm -hmm. didn't match with the uh, diagram above it. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't match. That's con that's what's confused me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, it's. I think this is this is well tested. Yeah, it should be pretty uh, solid. Yeah, no, that looks pretty good. So yeah, yeah. Oh, they have. Oh, they don't have clay heat, but they have. I've seen this Z normalization. I'm. I don't. I really. I've seen it a couple of times now, but. So instead of going zero to one, they they center it, and then you you go like minus something to plus something. Yeah. Yeah, like that would be the same as you know, like the normalization in a ResNet, wasn't it? Like, I see. I think it sort of uh, puts the mean at a value, and then like the standard deviation on either side. So. I see. Okay. Yeah, you yeah, know, it looks good if we can sort of try that. Okay. Um. By the way, I was poking around. Well, 
listening to you also and it seems monai also has some transformation okay like that uh, yeah you know, fine and... i'll stop sharing yeah the torch io one though it looks as if it's just sort of purely four transformations and stuff and augmentations doesn't yeah. it so. uh uh-huh. yeah yeah um yeah this is the okay tutorials yeah. and then it talks about transformation module cd images yeah and then see random elastic cd and random of this and that's it and then it shows resampling for consistent voxels and then reorientation and then random of find transformation and then random elastic yeah So yeah, I think uh, whichever of these is easier to use and does what has support for transformation that you're interested in. Right? Yeah, my training notebook now. Yeah, like I'm running it in Google Collab because of the fact because of the fact that it just. only uses the segmentation region now the actual like data sets reasonably small so it meant i could stick it up in collab or as i couldn't do that before with the dicom images um yeah so i can run for like a lot longer and i'm not using my uh, my kaggle C- gpu time um so if i can share like uh, if i can give you the the notebook or whatever and the data then you can play with that and then you can like yeah. do whatever you want with the model or the transformations and things and um yeah yeah you can do you know maybe um uh, fun with some uh and some experiments yeah um yeah like something like um do you know like the sweeps in 1db um yeah like with it you could like set up sweeps and like get it to like run through like a load of transformations and just specify the probabilities for them and because you're running on collab or whatever you should be able to do it like quickly and like let it run for a long time um yeah, yeah. are you submitting for score i mean you're obviously submitting for scores on the kaggle from some of the runs is that how you do are doing it Well, I haven't submitted anything to Kaggle in a while yet, so I've just about oh, finished. Nice. I've just about finished the inference thing because, like, yeah, there's like quite a lot goes on to to take the images and convert them from DICOM to NumPy, and then do the segmentation, and then do the splitting into cubes and stuff. So I've just about finished the inference thing. And um, so, like, once I have that, then it should just be a case of like when you've trained a model, like uh, create a data set and load it into the inference. So. hopefully i should have that finished tomorrow and then i can submit um yeah because i think um i mean as we discussed i guess we should really be focused much more on the validation that especially if you again also do the k-fold type of stuff then that would really give a good because it averages over the full as well because right now it's a single split correct that's right yeah yeah so uh, i think they do three fold or something too in the paper so yeah i think just doing augmentation plus three fold is about all the experiments given the time that we can run in at that point i think i think so yeah transform sorry i think so i got when i was doing it with like the 2d slices 
yeah, like just like classification on the 2D slices from the ones that had transforms. It sort of it sort of was giving me similar type of results to what I am getting at the minute with the cubes. Um, so I don't know, is it worth sort of ensembling like a, a 2D model in with the 3D model as well? Perhaps like sort of doing augmentation on the 2D oh. might put its performance up a bit. Interesting. I see. So you're saying take the, I think that one you had already shared and that's the one that I had run, I think, right? That, I that's right, yeah. To successfully run it and get some scores. Um, so you're saying if we did some augment, yeah, I, I had not tried that. Maybe I'll try that because at least it's working. Um, I mean, the pipeline and everything is working, right? So it's just a matter of throwing in some augmentations in the 2D space, right? Yeah. And be because of the fact that, yeah, like in the uh, in the image processing pipeline, it goes from the DICOM to 3D NumPy arrays. So like at that stage there, the, the 2D slices are available. So we could put those through a 2D model at that stage. And then the next step is like cutting it into cubes or whatever. So that would give us the 3D one. And then, yeah, we could like ensemble the, the results. Yeah, let me just run, you know, that model with some augmentations and see whether that improves um, the score or what it does. I mean, I did try, did I try? I think, uh, oh yeah, I tried with weight decay and it didn't do much. It kind of about gave the same. Else. Yeah. Um, right. But also, at least in that notebook, I thought the submission, oh no, the selection of the model was based on the loss. So I'll try changing it to accuracy and see whether that makes any difference. Yeah. I thought I could be wrong, but I thought that choice was based on loss. Um, and I had played with accuracy first and then switched to loss when I when Mihul and I were doing it on the different. Let me at least try augmentation at the 2D. That'd be something going to ask. See whether it gets any better results in just the 2D space with augmentation thrown in. And I can try with a bunch of different augmentations. At least the ones they talk about in you know, horizontal vertical flip and salt and paper and Gaussian. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, as I say, I, I should have the inference kernel finished by tomorrow, so hopefully I should be able to submit something from that. And then, yeah, like I'll, I'll share the other one I have with you that you can put on Colab or whatever, and then you can yeah, try pulling bits and pieces in and out of it. Yep, this one has been a long uh, slog with a lot of data processing, yeah. but that's that's I think the big uh, deal. It'll be kind of fascinating to see. I I think you know what you've done, Steve, is probably the right approach. It's just a matter of then doing all the things around it, like the augmentations, and then all these. Uh, you know, which kind of normalization you use. And uh, so I think fundamentally the approach is sound, but it's just a matter of tackling this uh, methods to tackling lack of generalization. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, at the minute, it just doesn't appear to be able to generalize at all. It doesn't, it doesn't yeah. appear to be much better than random, but um, yeah, because... Finally, like, oh, sorry. One sec there. Um, if I can find the notebook I had before. Um, I've got so many now. Oh, yeah, so. Oh, one more question while you're bringing this up. Um, sorry, go ahead. Do you finish your train of thought? I had one other thought. There. Yeah, like, yeah, so like when I'm training the thing, 
because I was looking for like these rock rock curves. So like at, on each epoch, mm-hmm. I, I print them out. And so, yeah, like mostly, yeah, like as, as you know, like the, the blue dotty line or whatever means that the model is worthless or whatever. It's not any better than random. Um, right. But yeah, so like at the start of the week or whatever, everything I was like trying was just ending up looking like this, like lit underneath the blue line or on the blue line. And yeah, so it was just like finally at the end of the week, I started getting this, like started getting some daylight between. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I have like, obviously you want it to like to come up here, like, yeah, that. Right. but yeah. So like the fact that I've actually made the uh, yellow line move away from the blue line in this direction. But yeah, I was like quite pleased about it. So sort of the first time that had happened. So hopefully with yeah. a bit of augmentation, I should push it a bit. So. Um, the question I wanted to ask was, um, you know, um, is it possible or, um, you know, you're using a separate, I mean, you're using a lunar model, right? Or, um, now, to do the classification after, is there, uh, the segmentation is done using, I would imagine, some kind of unit architecture and that type of stuff. So that's right, yeah. when we use then, sorry? Yeah, yeah, that's right, it's just a, a unit. Right, and now, if that is itself used as a classifier, you would still stick some simplistic model like the lunar model on top of it, to get the classification, right? Yeah. Sorry, did you mean stick the classifier on top of the unit? Yeah. That's, um, I mean, in effect, that's kind of what we are doing eventually, even though we separate and process the data in between the two steps to get rid of a lot of the extra pixels. But eventually, that's kind of what we are doing, right? Yeah. Conceptually. Yep. I mean, everything in between we do is just to process the data and reduce it to be more relevant to the classifier rather than processing a ton of data that's irrelevant. Yeah, so, well, plus as well, like it lets you use whatever type of classifier you want. I'm not sure how hard it would be to, to stick the thing onto, onto the unit itself. But, yeah. Yeah, so like these are the type yeah, of metrics I'm using at the minute. So, yeah, like the F1 score, this is sort of like around about the best I've got on the validation set. It's like only 0.63. Yeah, I've started like looking yeah. at this as well as actually um, what this figure is, this correct figure. Obviously, like in each individual tumor, you have maybe, I don't know, maybe 500 uh, cubes. So like each one of those cubes is predicting is it MGMT or not MGMT. Um, so, so this figure here is like taking the like the majority vote from those cubes and then like seeing how many of the validation set it actually predicted right. So this isn't this isn't how many of the cubes are right. This is actually sort of when they voted all of the cubes in a tumor. So again, like this is sort of around the best score I'm getting at the minute would be. Yeah, maybe sixty percent correct. Um, so run by me again. So it says like majority voting of the cubes predicting the MGMT uh, as one or zero. Yeah. So it's all of these other figures. So like this accuracy here, this accuracy is the number of individual cubes that correctly predict predicted the MGMT. Um, whereas like this one here, this correct figure is the majority vote of all the cubes in a, in a single tumor. 
from a, yeah from a single study ID to say whether they got it right or not. Mm. Yeah, because so, I've been. Very great. Yeah, I, I was going to say I'd been hoping that if fifty if fifty seven percent of all cubes were predicted correctly, then I was hoping that um, all of the cubes within an individual tumor. Perhaps if the majority of them said, yes, I've got MGMT, that they would have predicted overall the, the score better. But there's not a lot in it, really. Mm. But what I was thinking is, you know, you were saying you uh, one of the things you were planning on trying, and I think that's a good uh, direction given what the paper says, is also reducing the threshold of pixels that you have set at, I don't know, currently you said 10% and you wanted to reduce it to like, you know, something even smaller if it has a tumor than including, correct? Yeah. Now, if you did that, then would this number on the right, the correct, go? would you expect it to go down or go up? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I suppose it depends. Yeah, like I think somewhere during all of this, I'd read that one of the ways to sort of detect the MGMT was like look at the sort of the edges of the tumor to look at like it's uh -huh. the, the shape of the edges of it. And so at the minute, I'm maybe throwing the edges away because of the fact that if there's not a lot of tumor there, I've thrown the thing away and that's where the edges are going to be, the bits with not a lot of tumor. So mm -hmm. perhaps by uh, taking like any cube that's got any, even a single pixel, pixel of tumor in it, then perhaps You're it'll get better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like certainly, as yeah. I say, I, I got better, I got better scores once I included the bits of the brain around the tumor. As, as okay, opposed so to I just think that's a promising them. direction to, uh, uh, yeah. So that's probably priority one, right? Drop it to like even a single voxel. Yeah. See whether the score improves and whether the orange line moves away from the blue line even further. Yep. Then try different augmentation, and then you know the, the fold. I think those, by the time even you get, we get those three working, you get those three working, it would be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you would hope, like, because of the fact that, like, uh, we've done so much to sort of zoom in on the tumors and stuff that our model would perform better than other people who are just using sort of the whole brain, but I'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I, 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 that's why I'm much more confident in your approach, like that it wouldn't be this, you know, um, I mean, that doesn't mean we end up, uh, we'll end up winning the stuff, but it would at least, you know, all these, because my uh, submission, it, it got same, Result. In fact, I think my holes was slightly better too. Mine was 0.62. Yours was 63 or something, right? Uh, my hole. Yeah. The best result. Yeah. Uh, 0.63. Yeah. Mine was 0.62, but it was. Yeah. His was 0.3. Yours was 0.63 or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's always been in that range, 0.63. I think maybe I got right, 0.65, right. but. Yeah, it's, uh, it looks random. Yeah, but if you look at it, it's just random, right? I mean, it's right. just the fact yeah. that uh, by luck, it picked up something and right. you know, it hasn't learned squat uh, from the plots and stuff. So yeah. I think, uh, Steve, especially your the plot that you showed currently, that where the line is bumping up consistently is the true marker of some positive results. So, I mean, I think if the um, these three things, right, meaning if dropping the number of 
uh, your thresholding way down and then increasing augmentation and then uh, but that's where though you know the thing that still puzzles me is if augmentation of the thing helps then um in generating more images then also i would if you'd ask me naively then i would think that utilizing all four types should also increase because that is giving you again increase in your input data right but somehow that doesn't seem to matter yeah i still um, yeah I, i shared a discussion thread like where i found like uh, the past two or three papers like like three or four research papers on this topic and one one theme was like they all got the best result on the t2 weighted right and it didn't make sense i mean i don't know why i i, I didn't see um but two different groups different data sets uh, they're like yeah i got my best result on t2 weighted images um yeah. yeah like um i was just running on one on the two uh-huh. one ones yeah. just because of the fact that like i think in the 2d it gave me sort of slightly better results okay and yeah it was basically just to get things up and running by just like sort of concentrating on one but there's no reason to to drop the others yeah. it's just i hadn't got around to having time to test those other ones and like yeah like as as you say Srinivas it's uh uh yeah like if I was to use the other three types as well then it would like to increase the amount of data we we have so. yeah but i don't know i mean that's puzzling too that if lack of data is the thing and if so i don't know that may be another thing to try um um you know if you think mm. and uh, once you have the stuff work up the we can say the data and maybe i'll just run with um you know while you do all the other thing is i can just do the simple runs where i'm not doing you know, too much with it other than maybe just run it with all of the types and see how that result looks you know uh something simple like that which can still give us some idea of uh, and run it maybe with for each type independently and in the 3d thing that's closer to the final config i i mean even as you switch the augmentation and the uh, fold i can use the current setup you have to just run each type in 3d with the current setup and see which of the types and because you have done the experiment only with 2d right yeah that's right yeah and i can do it <clears throat> in the current setup and meanwhile you need not spend that I mean, collapse cycles on that. And you can get a point in. Yeah. Um, and I can just change the type and run it for each type and see which of the type. And the final, you know, kind of. The, you, you do have the ensembling uh, logic as well in the current notebook. You just don't use it, right? Um... I haven't put any ensembling logic in yet, but I don't think. Oh, okay. Because it would be similar to what. <clears throat> is there any reason why it would be different than what we've done? I have to check. Because we were Mehul and I were doing it in the other notebook. I just need to check whether it's. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, different. sorry. I remember that. I, I did have it in one of the old notebooks. Yeah. where it ran yeah for it ran four separate models and then averaged over them so right right yep because then it's just a matter of running each of them seeing what each looks like and then running one with all of them right yep Yeah, so if the data and the notebook is shared later, whenever you feel comfortable, I can see that I can do that on Colab. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I've got I've got the data on Colab, and I bring it into my notebook. You know, using the G down thing, where it uses like the the ID. 
Yeah, so I'm not sure if you can actually just pull the data straight out of my Google Drive. Perhaps if I make it public. Yeah, if you, you can do, send you a even... link or something, I can try it and let you know whether it works. Yeah, so I'll, I'll send you the um, the notebook or whatever, which has like the G down link. And I think if I make that public, then you don't even need to get the data yourself. I think you can just pull it straight out of my drive. Okay. So I'll send you that and see how you get up. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Okie dokie. Okay, thanks for joining me. Back yeah. to so what yeah, is the uh, child's name, by the way? Uh, so his name is yeah. He's just about to wake up. His name is Rohan. Let me just share a few photos Rohan. on. His name's what? Sorry. Uh, Rohan R uh, R O H yeah R O H A N. I think it has many meanings. It even has some meanings in Irish and, <laughs> and Arabic. Like, uh, oh, really? the, rider, the Riders of Rohan from uh, Lord of the Rings? The, there is a bit of that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, were, uh, we are LOTR fans, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's a power. Yeah, we really like that name. It took us a while to get. Yeah, I just put some pictures in. With uh, in the in the chat with you, me, and uh, Rekin, yeah. <laughs> with yeah, with the four of us, there you see. I like his uh, middle pose there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me see. Can I put a video? Uh, let me see. Uh, video. Oh yeah. Yeah, I like it. Like I think I like his first thing is like, what are you guys doing on? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll put a video. See, just see, does it play in Slack for you? Yeah. Mm, let's see. Yeah. Just, he well, wants his... Yeah, 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 it does. <laughs> yeah, whoa. He's like opening his eyes and going, what the hell is this? Yeah. <laughs> because we had to feed him. He's, he's, he's tiny, right? So what's happening is he's supposed to drink 60 ml, okay? but then he drinks 30 and he's tired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is too much work, man. <laughs> so then he starts falling asleep. So then I just, I was just coming up with new ways to wake him up. <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. Like normally, uh, normally you never wake babies. Normally, uh, if they're sleeping, you let them sleep. So <laughs> yeah, to yeah. Enjoy, to enjoy your peace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so at least yesterday when we met her, she said, if he's like, don't let him go like six hours, five hours without feeding. Yeah. Uh, so in the daytime, wake him every three hours, and in the nighttime, wake him every four hours. I'm like, shit. <laughs> 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 so it's it's a lot. It's like minimum eight feedings. So it's just me and, and it's just me and my wife. So we, we can't have any help uh, because of COVID. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And his vaccines, he gets many of his vaccines at, so he's now nine days old, but we had to wait for two months before. Like in India, they give some of the vaccines sooner, but here they give it at two months. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's okay. It's slowly. <laughs> okay, I, I think I should go. He's just getting up. And, yeah. Uh, okay, okay cool. Thanks, folks. Okay. Yep, Good thank to you. Speak to you. Yep. All right. Uh, uh, speak soon. Yep, talk to you.